My talk is how to make friends and influence people with HTML5 and stuff. Um, I'm Nicholas Otto. I work for Fleet Ventures as well. Um, I see Mike put us both up front so we could you know, get out of the way and enjoy the conference. Um, yeah, sure you do. <laughs> so, okay, so, um, yeah, so at Fleet Ventures, we do a lot of HTML5 stuff, and, um, and really, we're, we're really diving into it. Uh, we've been spending the past couple of months evaluating it and seeing where we can use it. Um, and we're fortunate on our medical software, which is wh where I primarily work, we, we can tell our clients, no, you have to use certain browsers, so we don't have to support such fun projects as, you know, Internet Explorer and all that. So um, if, you, if, you, if you're doing IE6 apps, well, you should probably leave because it's all worthless to you anyway, and it, you better spend uh, using this time to convince your boss that you should let your users upgrade. Um, so, okay, so what is HTML5? In case you didn't know, it's HTML4++, next iteration, kind of, you know, standard stuff. It's not XHTML, that's dead, there's no longer version two. Um, so HTML5 is the way to go, and it really is the only way. Um, and a lot of people, when they say HTML5, they think of the cool examples online, like, um, I think it was Tuesday, Google had their uh, Canvas demo where you could go and you could move the mouse through their logo and all the balls would move everywhere. Um, that is, you know, Canvas, and a lot of the, the HTML5 stuff people think of, it's really HTML5 plus CSS3 plus a whole bunch of new JavaScript APIs that aren't part of that standard. Um, so, one thing to note, if it worked in HTML4, it probably will still work in HTML5. Um, and even if it's not in the standard and it's something bad that you shouldn't use, like Blink or Marquee that, you know, I know you're thinking, how can I not make a real website without those? Um, <laughs> browsers will still support that for a while because we have to face it, you know, there's crappy developers out there that write bad code. Um, of course, no one here would. So they still support it. So if you really wanted Blink and Marquee and you didn't want to do CSS because you're weird like that, you still theoretically can do it. Um, your mileage may vary. And one thing to note, remember, is that HTML5 isn't this massive standard that you have to wait for you know, the entire thing to be implemented before you can start using it. You can start using key parts of it, like Canvas or video, right now um, on almost any browser. Um, when you start getting to some of the more abstract stuff, like uh, validations and forms or certain tags, um, there, then you have to check by browser. Um, some will only work in Opera, some only in Chrome, WebKit, you know, in general or, or whatnot. So. Um, Quick warning, uh, it's in the working draft. Stuff might change, which really is stuff will change, so be prepared for that. Um, as I said, a lot of it's pretty stable, so you can start using it today and you won't have to really change anything. Uh, most of the changes will be done browser side, so unless you're writing Chrome or Firefox, then you probably won't have to worry about it. Um, it's supposed, theoretically, it's supposed to reach uh, recommendation by the end of this year, so hopefully Christmas present to web developers. Um, but they missed their last deadline by about eight or nine months, so no one knows if that's going to carry over, if they're just going to eat that lost time or, or what. So we'll see. Um, and candidate recommendation, which is kind of the, the last step, or the second to last step in the W3C is the end of 2012. So who knows, maybe HTML5 will bring up on the end of the world. Um, Ian Hickson, who I believe works for Google, he's really big in the community, he's part of the standards board. Um, is estimated that it won't actually be a candidate recommendation until 2022. So if you have a pointy hair boss out there who you know is like, oh, it must be standardized, everyone must be using it, you're probably not doing Ruby, you're probably doing COBOL or something and looking at upgrading to Java, but, <laughs> but th just be aware of that. Um, really, it's not really an issue, and um, I'm gonna give a quick overview of kind of the W3C procedure so that you can kind of counter with, well, okay, this is where it's at, this is where it's gonna go, you know, let's just use it anyway. Um, so right now it's in a working draft. Um, that's when anyone, you know, the unwashed masses like us can go and complain and, and talk and discuss it. Um, next it goes through a last call working draft, kind of just, hey, you know, roll to bed, you know, give your comments. And then it goes to candidate recommendation. This is where um, it goes and the implementer, so, you know, people like Microsoft and Apple and Google, um, and Mozilla, they're all gonna get their opinions in. They're gonna say, no, we can't make a browser without Blink or Marquee, you're crazy. So, and then they, they debate it for a while. And then once it passes candidate recommendation, it goes to a proposed recommendation. 
this is where it goes to the, council, the advisory council for W3C, and they talk about it, and they discuss it, and they spend you know, the next 20 years arguing over it. And then once there's two 100% complete uh, implementations, then it's a recommendation. And that's where that 2022 date is, whereas the proposed recommendation or candidate recommendation could be you know, this year or within the next couple of years. 2022 is where you're going to get this last step. And really, by the time it gets to 2022, you're probably going to be doing HTML 6 or 7 or 10 um, or doing custom extensions and all that. So it's not really an issue unless you have to have it 100% you know, complete. Um, no web talk would be complete without talking about browsers. And you know, I'm sure everyone here knows kind of what the big players are in the market. You know, Chrome's one of them. Safari, they're both WebKit. Um, a lot of the stuff, if it works on one, it works on the other. You don't have to worry, wor worry about it. There are some features that are Chrome or Safari specific that, you, um, that are kind of a pain in the butt. There's Opera, which they seem to implement standards before they're even you know, thought up. So, but no one uses it. It's kind of a, co a cool toy. There's Firefox. Um, they're kind of, the, the, in my opinion, the new IE. They're slow. They're getting slower. Um, and people are having problems with it. But they're still fairly standards compliant. And they're still a good browser. Um, you have IE9, which this is your you know, morning heresy. Um, so get your stones ready and someone go light a, a pile outside to burn me. But IE9 is actually a good browser. Microsoft's done a really good job in the past year, year and a half, or how long they've been working on it, of making a standards compliant browser that doesn't like, ultimately suck. You know, it's no IE6. Um, and actually, if you look at speed tests, um, it's actually faster than Firefox in all areas, which isn't you know, known for its speed, but it's nice not to be last place. Um, and if you're working with IE earlier than 9, I'm sorry for you. Yet again, this talk isn't probably going to be helpful. Go argue with your boss about you know, using real browsers and being big boys. Um, there is some, there's a lot of plugins that you can use in IE 6 to 8 that will make it a semi-real browser, one of them being Google Chrome Frame. But if you're going to force your users to install a plugin, you might as well force your users to install a real browser. So good luck with that. Um, and so, so really quickly, there's a, there's a couple of things. Uh, there's two levels of obsolescence in HTML5. There's some stuff that will still conform, and it's mostly just you know syntactical. Well, you shouldn't declare the default values of stuff because that's just stupid. Um, and then there's stuff that won't conform, and it will blow up when you try to validate it, and the website will make fun of you. Um, so some conforming stuff is using HTTP quiv in the meta tag, um, setting the image border equal to zero. You know, that's the default. Why are you doing that? So you really shouldn't be using that. And summary of the table. I'm not sure on why they chose that one, but they did. Um, you can go check on their website. There's, there's a couple more things, but these are really the biggest things that I think will probably affect people here um, if they were to go switch over to HTML5. Um, so stuff that's been removed, and this is the stuff, as I said, that will cause your code or your markup not to validate. Um, applet and Nomad, uh, you should use embed or object instead. Uh, frame, frame set, those are completely gone. Can't use them anymore. Um, you still have iframes, so if you need that type of framing stuff, there you go. Um, and a whole bunch of CSS-related stuff. So I, you know, I've kind of picked on uh, Marquee and Blink, but there's TT, there's Strike, there's U, Big, Center, Font, and a whole bunch more. So um, Go check the website. There's a bunch of stuff on there. Most of it's just, if you, the general idea, and you're, you're good if you stick to this, if you can do it in CSS, do it in CSS. There's no reason to have all these redundant tags that you're using instead. Um, and kind of, the general consensus is there's kind of five main features that are the cool ones that everyone wants to use, and then a bunch of boring stuff that you know, people here, you know, you're probably like, be like, whoa, that's cool, you know, makes developing so much easier. But, you know, Joe Sixpack isn't really going to care if you can embed data in your HTML better. But like, well, that's not fun. Um, I want to, you know, have cool demos that I can click on stuff. Um, so Canvas is a big one, and I'm going to go over these uh, in, a, in more depth. So I'm just kind of covering them here. Uh, video, web sockets are really sweet. Uh, web workers and web storage. Um, there's one more that I think is really cool. It's called Microdata, and I'll cover it at the end. But it's not really, you know. Average consumer, interesting. So getting started, um, traditionally, if you've had to write HTML, you know, you're developing a website, you've had to write something like this. And I don't know about you guys, but I have to go look that up every time. It's a major pain in the ass. 
I have to be like, well, is it doc type XHTML? Because I'm doing XHTML, but no, it's HTML, and yeah, it's a mess. So this is probably the coolest feature, why you should switch to HTML5, you know, drop everything, is it's just that, doc type HTML. <laughs> and if you're doing Haml, it's just exclamation three times and then a five. Even simpler, so, you know, make life easier, switch to HTML5, there you go. Um, and as I said, it's backwards, browsers are backwards compatible, so if you do HTML5 stuff, and um, a good example is the forms, you can, there's different form tags um, and attributes, and the browser doesn't understand it, most of the time it will just ignore it and treat it as if it's plain text and some element that it doesn't understand, and it won't blow up. So there's no reason not to be using a lot of this HTML5 stuff um, other than you're just lazy. Um, and one thing to note is that you can't detect HTML5 support. Um, you can, I mean, you can kind of cheat, and if your, your user's running IE6, it's not gonna support anything. So, you know, fall back to Flash or whatever you're doing. But if you're on a real browser like Chrome or Safari or, or something, you can detect it. Um, the, there's modern, Modernizer.js that is a wrapper that makes it a lot easier. Um, and as you can see by that code example, all you do is modernizer.canvas, and that checks to see if you have Canvas support or video or web sockets or, or whatever the feature is that you're gonna implement. Um, you can also, if you don't want to include an extra JavaScript library, you can call attributes on that, you know, on the canvas tag or whatnot, and it won't return anything, and then you know they don't support it. But it's a small file, and it supports a whole lot of HTML5 and CSS3 stuff, and so you can just detect and see if you can support it. Um, so one cool thing um, I like is HTML structure. Um, so this is kind of how you would do it before. Um, in HTML4 or whatnot, you'd have all your divs, and of course you're not doing tables, so you don't have to worry about that. But, so you have all your divs, and you just put you know, an IV on them, and then you go write up CSS to float stuff, you know, certain directions and stuff like that. Well, so in HTML5, they kind of, you know, they thought about it, and they're like, well, everyone seems to have, this is 99% of websites out there, have some sort of layout that, like that. You might put your sidebar on the right or on the left, but chances are if I go look at your website, it's gonna look like that. Um, so HTML5, they kind of just reduce that and they have new uh, structure tags that, you know, so you have a header, you have a nav, um, you have articles, you have a footer and, and a side. So they really make that a lot simpler and easier to use. So that's another cool feature of HTML5. Um, so video, video, you know, if you've gone to YouTube or Vimeo, a lot of these bigger sites are starting to upgrade if they haven't upgraded their, all their content to HTML5. Um, now it requires some re-encoding from Flash and stuff like that, so it's gonna take a while if you're a site the size of YouTube or something, but, but um, you, chances are you've already seen it, and you really, as a user, you don't see a difference other than you can actually use HTML5 video on devices like um, Android and iPhone and, and stuff like that. So um, it's one of the few features that is more or less implemented across the board. Um, now the tag is, but the problem that you're gonna run into is video codecs and audio codecs. Um, some work on some browsers, some work on others, some uh, certain OSs and stuff like that. Um, and then as developers, or as you know, the company, some of them you have to pay money for, and some of them are free. So, it, that's, so that kind of leads into the next bullet point, which is choices. You know, everyone loves choices. Choices are good, you know, vanilla or chocolate. But in this case, choices just means major pain in the ass because you have to support different browsers and there's no one standard um, codec that works across everything yet. So, you know, if, if Microsoft and, and Apple would support, you know, AUG video, then there would be, um, and there'd be a free alternative. Right now, kind of your best bet is H.264 um, and AVI. So containers and codecs, just to clear something up. Um, when you go and you download a video from iTunes or your favorite, you know, non-iTunes Swedish site, that when you download that AVI or MKV or whatever format it's in, that's not the actual video file. That's just a container. And at the very basic, you have a, a video track that doesn't have audio, and then you have at least one audio track that doesn't have video, and they do, there's stuff in the containers that lets them sync it up and all that, and I'm not gonna cover that. You can go research that. But that's one thing to be aware of. And so you have, you know, a bunch of, you have several kind of major containers out there um, and, and some codecs. You know, Flash is the top one. You know, everyone's seen Flash, AVI, MP4. AUGV is a little rare. It's open source. If you're a fan of Stallman, you'll, you'll love it. It <laughs> saves your babies. Um, you don't sell your soul to Microsoft or Apple or anything like that. Um, it's not as performant 
as you know, uh, Theor is not as performant as something like H.264, which you you know pay out the ass in licensing and stuff like that. Um, but it's free and it makes ponies smile. So, um, and then there's Google's alternative, which is WebM. There are patents on it, so that could potentially be an issue. Google's promised not to do evil and not to sue anyone. So we'll see how that works out. But it is an alternative. They use Vorbis for the audio. Um, so part of it's free, and really the only potential issue is um, VP8. Um, and so, and I've already mentioned H.264, it's got patents. Um, there's, if you, if you just create a website and you wanna put you know, pictures of your cat and you encode it in H.264 uh, and you just have that video, um, theoretically they can come after you and make you pay money um, based on the number, it's, uh, there's a tiered system based on how many views and stuff you have like, uh, like that, but they can make you pay money to use that. Um, the, the governing body for that has said we're not going to charge anyone or charge kind of just developers and you know, sites and stuff um, a fee until I believe 2013. So theoretically you can get away with it, but it's one of those things, you know, they're like drug dealers that get you addicted and then you're you know, stuck with it. And if you, you know, let's say you make the next YouTube, you don't really want to convert terabytes if not petabytes of data to some new format because that's going to take forever. Um, so that's the one thing to keep in mind. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so Canvas, Canvas is a cool thing. Um, very basic idea is it's a rectangle that is invisible. You can't tell the difference between a page with a canvas on it and a blank page um, it, that you can use JavaScript to draw on. And really you can do anything on it that you want. Um, you can have multiple in one page because each one has its own state. So um, that's good to know. So you can put tons of different canvases on a page. Um, everything in it's 2D. Um, if you want to do 3D, um, I believe WebGL is the way to go. And there's a guy speaking on it today, so you're in luck. Um, I'm not going to cover that. So 3D is not part of the standard. Um, they acknowledge that you know someone may want to do 3D because you know it's one of those new up-and-coming technologies. But you know it's not in the standard. Um, and everything on Canvas, it's you know it's a 2D grid, and you start in top left corner at zero zero. You know kind of basic stuff. Um, you can do a lot of stuff on it, you know, like I said, you can, do, you can just you know, draw text on there, you can do gradients, images, video, um, and even kind of a poor man's green screening type thing. Um, there's a cool demo out there that Mozilla's done where they have a video tag on one side and it's just this guy talking at a conference or something, and he's got a green, there's a greenish screen behind him, and then they have two canvas elements. On the first canvas, they just draw the video on there, and you're kind of like, well, that's boring. Um, I have a video tag to play video. Why do I need Canvas? But on the second tag, on the second Canvas, what they're doing is on every frame they're they're figuring out where the green is and they're replacing it with the Mozilla logo. So you know, essentially, they're doing some sort of basic watermarking type stuff. Um, and so that's that's a cool feature. You can draw on your video and kind of layer stuff. Um, you know, one thing to remember is if you are doing watermarking or something, it is JavaScript. Users could disable it. And then be like, oh, I never saw that. I, I didn't know I couldn't take that. It wasn't free. Um, it's on the internet, of course. So it's one thing to keep in mind. Um, so next cool feature is web storage. Um, and traditionally, if you wanted to do something like this and you wanted to persist your save data on the client between uh, page loads, you'd have to do something like cookies. And cookies, you know, everyone has probably used them and hates them. And cookies really suck if you think about it. You know, the first biggest problem, it's only 4K. You know, we're, we all live in this post Bill Gates world where, you know, he said 640K was the most anyone's ever going to need. You know, so where's my other 636K? Um, and so you're, so you're wasting, since it goes back and forth every request, you're wasting all this bandwidth that, you know, probably isn't a big deal now that everyone has three megs or five megs or if you're in a real country like Japan, 50 or 1,000 or a gajillion, but, you know, you have these real connections, and so that's probably not an issue, but one thing that is is encryption, and unless you encrypt your entire site, chances are your cookies aren't encrypted. So um, and one thing to think about, you know, stop and think about it, is, you know, client has storage, why not use that? Um, then you don't have to send data back and forth every, you know, time you, you want to request something, and it's on there. They can worry about storage and all that. Um, so that's where web storage comes in. And there's two parts to it. There's local storage, which is per domain, and it persists after the browser closes. Um, so it's kind of cookie like cookies. Um, a good example for this would be if you wanted to have a, a remember me login type thing. Um, you put it in the local storage. 
it saves it. When they come back, they're automatically logged in. Session storage would be something like if you're writing bank software where you don't want your users logged in because there's kind of that assumption that if you go to your bank website and you close your browser, that you're no longer going to be logged in because you don't want the next person to come along and be like, oh, I can see he has $20 in his account. I'm going to go take that. So you know, that's where you would use something like session, session storage, which is per page window and for the lifetime of the window. Um, it also lets you do, you know, because it's that way, it lets you uh, run multiple instances of the same application you know, side, to side, or side by side. Um, and this is actually one area where Internet Explorer has actually done something first. Um, they have a feature called user data that was implemented starting version like five or six or something, so back in the day. Um, and it's not the same thing, it's not part of the standard, but it's similar. So if you do need to do uh, web storage type stuff back on an older IE, you can kind of hack this way and, and give it a shot. Um, so uh, web workers are another cool stuff, another cool thing. Um, it's easy to think of them just as background JavaScript uh, or threads. You know, you go and you create a script and you, you create a new web worker. That web worker will then spin up that script and then do stuff in the background. Um, one caveat to know is that you don't have access to the DOM in that script. So you're kind of thinking, well, how, how do you do it? You do it messaging. Um, everything's done in messaging. You send messages to it if you want to send it new data. You send messages back if you want to do, um, you, you know, if you want to write something to the, the page or something like that. Um, and you know, no access to the parent page, so yeah, be careful. Um, and so here's some code. Here's a code example of a worker. Uh, you're creating a new worker, as I said, and you just load up the JavaScript. That's simple. Um, and then you create on the, on the worker instance, you create an on message handler. So when that script messages you back, you can then do something. So if you want to like print it out or alert or whatever, you, you, know, you have that. Um, and then if you want to you know, tell, OK, you know, here's some new data, here's some new work, go do this, you can then post a message. And one cool thing is that it will, you can just send whole objects over, and it will handle the serialization of uh, JSON all by itself, and you don't have to worry about that. Um, so next up is WebSockets. WebSockets, look, the code looks pretty similar. Um, but the basic idea is it's client server TCP sockets. Um, so you fire up on your web app. You open up a socket connection to the server. And then it's bidirectional, so then you can just keep sending data um, from the server. And you don't have to sit there and refresh. Um, and there's other solutions out there like Comet and stuff like that. But one thing that WebSockets tries to do is it tries to account for proxies and firewalls that uh, solutions like Comet can do, but they sometimes fail on you know, longer data transfers and streaming and stuff like that. Um, and WebSockets are, are really like dirt simple. They're easy to do. And on the, like this code example, um, this is all you have to do. The same idea as the web worker. You, know, you create a new WebSocket. You pass it a site. Um, and that's kind of where the data goes. Um, you can do WS for regular HTTP, and you can do WSS for encrypted stuff. Um, and then you just have your on message hand, uh, callback and all that. Um, and here's some Ruby code. This is a really simple uh, example. It's the only Ruby code in my uh, presentation, so enjoy. <laughs> um, but all this is doing is you're handling you know, you're handling different events. You're handling on open and on close. You know, you're adding the socket, you're taking the socket, uh, you're deleting that socket. Um, and then you're handling on message. And all that does is a message comes in and it goes over each of the sockets and it sends it out. Um, so one of my friends did a cool blog post on it. And he has a website where you just go there and you start mashing keys. And then, start, then you have a whole list of keys, you know, A through Z, and they all start lighting up. And so then if someone else comes to that website at the same time and starts mashing keys, then you'll see each other's key presses, and it's kind of cool. Um, and this is all you have to do. Um, it's using Event Machine and Event Machine WebSocket. They're both gems. They're both you know, downloadable, so go get them. Um, so offline web applications. Um, so your web app is obviously so cool, you want to be able to use it offline. Um, one problem with this is you're still going to run into issues with, you know, you obviously can't pull data from the web, you know, wherever your server is located if you don't have an internet connection. But um, this allows you to still be able to use that application in some sort of limited fashion. Um, and what we're using it for, or what we're planning on using it for, is on the medical software we're writing, you know, we have you know, nurses and doctors and stuff have to be able to schedule patients, you know, kind of standard stuff. 
Um, and so if their, let's say their backup server goes down and our main server goes down and their internet's down and someone kicks a puppy out front, they can still get online, or they can still use the application in a very, it's very limited, but it's still usable. Um, so they can still schedule patients and they can still see any data they have um, and, and use it. And so when they come back online and that puppy's saved and you know, everything's all good, then all they have to all it does is it it sends the data back it tries to figure it out and if there's any like scheduling conflicts like let's say there are two patients scheduled for the same time uh, someone has to manually deal with it but if there's no conflicts then you can just write a whole bunch of data to the database and be good um, so um, there's some cool stuff on this there's a client side SQL database um, not everyone supports it um, you're stuck with real browsers for now um, and then you do some caching. Um, using, and so what you do is you set up a cache manifest file, um, just a plain text file, and you set up a fallback page, you know, let's say they didn't cache something that they needed, um, and then you, know, you, ca you set up the, uh, the items, assets you want to cache. Um, and then in your HTML, all you do is add manifest, um, and you just have to, you have to, if you have multiple pages, like let's say you're just doing plain HTML, You'll have to put this on every page, but you know, obviously if you have some sort of application layout master page or whatever, depending on your technology, you just have to set it once and then it's cached, so it's easy. Um, client side SQL, if anyone's done JDBC or ADO.net type stuff, it's really similar to that. Um, it's no active record, but you just create, you open a database, um, first parameter is the name and then the version. Um, and then a description, and then an the last parameter there is kind of interesting. It's an estimated size of the database. Um, by default, you can get up to five megs uh, without prompting the user. If you want to get more than that, you can request more space, and then the user has to approve it. If they don't approve it, you're kind of screwed and you're stuck with five megs. Um, if they just click yes on everything and they hit yes, then you can get almost as much data as you need. Um, and then, you know, the first example, and then underneath that is a, Example insert, you know, just regular SQL that we all know and love, and we've written a hundred times, and really wish that we could use Active Record or, or, or Link or, or something like that. But you know, it gets the job done. Um, and then pulling data, you know, you just you know, do a query from you know your table, and then you iterate over the results and do whatever. So that's client side SQL. Uh, next up is geolocation. This is another thing that requires user approval. Um, and you don't, get, you don't have any access to user data without their permission, and I think that's a really good thing. Um, keeps users safe from malicious users. You know, of course, no one here is going to, but um, there are people out there. Um, it's not technically part of HTML5. It's kind of its own thing. Um, and a lot of mobile devices, you know, kind of legacy platforms that don't support HTML5, um, like BlackBerry or um, uh, Nokia or, or Windows Mobile, they all have their own versions, so that's one thing to be aware of. Um, that you can still do geolocation, it's just not as pretty, um, and there are some alter there are some wrappers for that. Um, it's opt-in, like I said, and users have to approve it, and it's non-blocking, so if you write your application, you have to set up a callback, so when the user, if they say, yes, I wanna allow you to get my information um, and rob me blind, that you then have, you know, so then you can do it. If not, you can reprompt the user, but that's not very nice, and you know, if the user says no, no means no. So, um, and it's Earth-centric, so if you want to cool, make a cool app that's on Mars or the moon or something, you're out of luck. Uh, go find something else. Uh, and one thing to keep in mind is, you know, cells versus laptops. Laptops, you know, when I was doing, looking up examples and writing code and stuff like that, it pretty much would get within, you know, on a good day it would get the actual street I live on, you know, whether in front of the house or back of the house, it was kind of like whatever, it's close enough. Um, but on cell phones, some, a lot of cells have dedicated GPS equipment and that is, will give you that accurate, you know, couple meters or whatever um, of their location. Uh, that's, you know, using more hardware. It's not nice to just start using, you know, random parts of hardware on someone's operating, on someone's phone, because it's gonna suck battery life. So you can do cell triangulation, and that will be, that can be anywhere between that couple meters accurate to, you know, kilometer or whatnot. Uh, so that's something to be aware of. And if anyone in here uses the iPhone, that's actually how Apple or Google does it on Google Maps. Um, they they start up with triangulation to kind of just be like, well, you're you're, you're in Utah, um, and then if you're like, well, I really want directions to you know the grocery store, 
Um, so then while it's trying to find a signal and working through that, um, it's, it's using triangulation. Once they have that signal, then it gives you your location and then it's you know, accurate and you can do turn by turn stuff if the weather permits and all that. Um, and you know, as I said, legacy platforms, um, you can use GeoJS, that's kind of a wrapper for all of those. It makes, it a lot, makes life a lot easier um, instead of having to target individual platforms that you know, two users are gonna be using a, a you know, Nokia device or something like that. So uh, forms get a lot of love in HTML5 and um, really the biggest thing are the new types for inputs. Um, and so really you just do the same thing, input types equals whatever. Um, and so there's an, I have some examples here. There's range, number, uh, date. You can't, I don't know if the people in the back can really see that, but the second one, it just has a spinner. And so you can just keep going up and down um, on your numbers. You can set the, the range you know, between one and 10 and how much it goes up and down by. Um, but one thing to remember, to keep in mind, is that you're, you may have different implementations and date is a good example of that. Um, the one on the left is Chrome Safari. Um, and that just is a date, you know, a string, and then you go up and down, and it's kind of a pain in the butt. And it defaults to something like 1583, or you know, some year that if someone says they're born in, they're probably lying, and they're just trying to, you know, get on porn or something. Um, so the one on the right is actually it isn't a jQuery plugin; it's Opera's implementation of that same date type. And so that's something to keep in mind. Um, there's other types. Um, like email, URL, telephone, uh, date time, and even a color picker. No one's implemented the color picker yet, so there's no real demo for that. Um, but if you've ever wondered how, how is Apple so smart when they go on my iPhone and they know me to get, which keyboard to give me, you know, do I want to target a phone number, do I want to target a URL, an email address, kind of what? Um, they're really not that smart. You know, you know, Steve Jobs is pretty cool, but he's not that cool. So all they're doing is they're using HTML5 stuff for the most part. And they're just, you know, if you have an email, you know, if your type is email, then they're gonna give you an email prompt. Or if it's a tell number, they'll give you numbers. Um, and uh, another thing that, they, that they're working on, um, and it's not really implemented um, outside of Opera, is validations. So I bet if I asked for a show of hands of who did, who's done an email validation, almost everyone would raise their hand. And then I would tell you that you've done it wrong and that you're an idiot. Um, <laughs> And not to be a jerk, but really there's a lot of email addresses out there that are valid that, you know, if you try, like Gmail is a good example. If let's say you have um, hunkylover at gmail.com and you want to do hunkylover plus, you know, your spam site, that will tell you, it lets you filter your email addresses and you can tell if they then sell that email address, you know, who they sold it to. And so you can, it lets you track down who's not legitimate and who's not honoring their, uh, uh, license agreement and all that. But a lot of websites, are, they see that plus sign and they're like, but that's not a valid email address. Why is that there? Um, and so I've tried doing that with my, my emails and you know, it's kind of a crapshoot, you know, 50-50 shot, whether they're gonna allow it or whether they're not gonna allow it and it's a pain in the butt. So it'd be nice if you can have your validations on this email, or on the, the browser, I'm sorry, and then you just don't have to worry about it. You're just like, make sure it's a valid email address or a valid phone number and then I don't worry about it and just life is good. And then you aren't an idiot anymore. Um, also another thing is like phone numbers. You know, we're used to a 10 digit phone number and that's kind of it. But I have a friend who's Russian and her phone number is I think 11 digits. And so that's a pain in the butt. And then within Russia, they have different lengths for cell numbers or you know, landlines and stuff like that. So really that's something that you don't wanna be handling because chances are you'll do it wrong. And chances are, even if you do it right for one case, like let's say you can get American numbers right, but you want to go open up your application in a, another country, you might be doing it wrong. And it's something that, you know, honestly, most people don't know and most people don't care. So just let the browser do it um, when it's implemented. You know, right now, as I said, Opera only is the only one that I've seen that does validations. Um, there's also placeholders, um, which are pretty cool. There's you know, J, uh, jQuery plugins that do stuff like this now, and it's kind of that, just that gray text that you see in an input box, that when you click in there, it disappears. That's a placeholder, that's part of HTML5. That's pretty well implemented across the board. Um, and there's also autofocus. Auto um, if you're doing any JavaScript code, um, this is another part where I'm gonna call you an idiot. 
if you're doing anything on load in terms of setting up you know, autofocus or something like that, you don't want to be doing that. You want to be doing something like document ready and jQuery because on load waits for everything to load. So you're waiting for your images to download and it's kind of a pain in the butt and it makes, you, it makes your application look like a piece of junk because you, know, you go and then you, your, your uh, cursor's moving around and you're kind of like, well, I don't want that to. Um, so yeah, that's forms. Forms got a lot of love. There's, there's some more to it, but those are kind of the cool features that um, are hit and miss in terms of implementation. But if you know you can target a specific browser, you can really go look, you know, see what's implemented right now in this version and go just start using that. Um, so the last thing we're going to talk about is microdata. And this is kind of what I think is the coolest feature that no one really knows about and no one really cares about um, because it allows you for, to get better Google results. And kind of like, well, okay. Um, and so that's why you know, normal people don't really care. Um, you get item value pairs, and it introduces five global attributes into your um, elements. So you get item ID, item prop, item ref, item scope, and item type. Um, and this will make more, more sense when I show an example. Um, and you know, as I said, better search results. Um, so here's an example of using microdata. And this sets up, it's kind of like XML-ish in the sense that you have a, a schema and all that. Um, but you just set up, and this is a, a real one. You can go to datavocabulary.org. Um, Google runs it. They've got some other predefined types, like person and, and uh, I think client and stuff like that. Um, and all you, you do is you set up all this data. So you know you have an address. You know you have a street out, uh, a street address. You have a locality, a region, postal code, and a country. It's kind of the default ones. Um, and so you're kind of like, well, okay. So that just makes more code. Why do I really care? Well, so what Google will do is that when they're, this is what Google will show you that it sees. You know, so it, on some level, it allows better transparency into the workings of Google, what they scrape, what they see. Um, and if you ever get a result that you know, you're like, wow, that, that gives me a lot more information than you know, just whatever is written down on the bottom that they just randomly grabbed and you're trying to figure out what's it, what's it about. And you're like, well, I can get the, the address or something right on Google. And this is because they've done something like this and that they can scrape it. Um, so if you're interested in this, um, there's the, the rich snippets program, which Google has. There's a lot more information on that. Um, and right now, browser, no, no browser supports extracting data from it. I mean, you can still do just regular jQuery or something like that to grab data out of those spans. But in terms of you know, browser-specific APIs or something like that, there's no support for it. So it's kind of, this is really the bleeding edge of HTML5, you know, when stuff like Canvas is kind of just, you know, old and boring at this point. Um, so yeah, that's microdata, that's cool. Um, I haven't used it, I've kind of, sorry, I need to consider it for some of our projects. Um, but I thought I'd mention it and kind of, you know, show you guys so that you can go play with it and hopefully if more people start using it, um, pick up traction and browsers start implementing it. Um, so yeah, that's the end of my talk. Here's some more info. Um, W3 is a good resource if you like dry and boring stuff. You just go read the standard. Um, I think it was Mountain West. Someone said, you know, I, I read the standard. It's only 5,000 pages or 5 billion pages or whatever. You know, everyone should do it. Um, I'm not going to recommend that. <laughs> but you know, when I was preparing this talk, they, it was really useful and it is really a, a good resource if you need it. If you want to go target one specific feature. Or something, you know. So you, um, there's a lot of people out there that are like, "Oh, HTML5, it's so cool. Here's a Canvas demo, or here's, you know, or geolocation's a good example. They just throw up a, oh, click, you know, click allow. Oh, we're gonna, you know, plot you on Google Maps. Kind of like, okay, I've seen that a couple thousand times, but that's cool. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thanks for listening. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah. So with the local web stores that you were talking about. Yeah. I don't. Um, I haven't used it yet. Um, it's one thing we're looking at using. Um, and really, it, it seems to tie into the offline web application kind of fallback stuff um, or keeping users logged in or, or saving data between uh, requests. Um, there's a couple of examples out there where someone just has a, a page and they're like, oh, look, it, you can type something into the form. Oh, an autofill is another thing that I didn't mention. But you can set up an autofill element, and then you just type stuff in there, and then you just set JavaScript to automatically save that. So then, if you refresh the page, you know whatever you wrote 
War and Peace or whatever is right there and you don't lose it. So, yeah. Um, I, I, I'm pretty sure there's a JavaScript library that will, like if you're doing local data stores, there's a JavaScript, JavaScript library that will help you auto sync changes back to the server. Just like if they do make some changes in offline mode, when it syncs back up, it'll auto sync and send it back up. So that's okay. So if anyone didn't hear, he said that he thinks there's a JavaScript library out there that will help you do the syncing from when they're offline to when they're online. Um, and that makes sense. I haven't really dived into it that much because we aren't starting to use it yet, but that's uh, good to know. Uh, yeah? So are there, when you're doing local data storage, are there like, kind of two distinct modes? Do you get a notification when uh, in JavaScript or something when, when the app is offline and you should be more dependent on the local data store? Or do you kind of always have the architecture out then to use the local data store and sync changes Okay, so he's asking, is there any sort of way to know if your, your app's offline or, you know, or, and how do you determine if you should, how heavily you should rely on the local data store and stuff like that? Um, so what, the, the way I was kind of thinking that we were gonna implement it is that we're gonna just do everything through the local data store um, because we have a lot of long running stuff. We have to do patient registration. We have to do integration with insurance companies and so we're hitting external stuff. Um, so we're all, in a sense, we're using it like a message queue type system, like a rabbit or, or whatnot. Um, and so I, I, I'm not 100% sure if there is a way to check if you're offline. I'm assuming there is. Um, if not, you could always just try to pull, a, just a, have some sort of um, asset on the server that isn't cached that you just try pulling down. If you can't get it, then you're like, oh crap, I'm offline. Um, so that's kind of my thoughts. Anyone else? All right. How many, how many puppies were kicked in the production of this? Uh, just yours. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Who is hunky porn at Gmail? Oh, hunky lover. <laughs> that's, uh, that's obviously me. That's my alter ego. Uh, when I'm not writing Ruby code, I'm, you know, scoring with chicks. Uh, it's hunky lover. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, if anyone here is single, it's a good thing to know, you know, just come up with some cool handle and be like, hey baby, I write Ruby. Um, <laughs> I know your last boyfriend wrote Java or something, I'm not that square. So, all right. <laughs> Thank you.